Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Anna Withers, and if we haven't met before, I work with Springfield Community Gardens as the farmer and uh, resource development manager. So I do a lot of work with farmers, with business planning, and connecting them with uh, educational resources or just helping expand their network of other growers in the area who they know. I help connect people with educational as well as financial resources. So really, whatever I don't know when you come to me, I find someone who does. And we're very lucky to have a very solid network of experienced farmers and uh, industry professionals. So if you are watching this and you do have questions about either getting started as a farmer or you're running into issues and you just need to ask someone questions, please reach out on our website um, and we will do our best to get you the help that you are looking for. Uh, I will put links to everything we talk about in the chat. Uh, but I did want to mention our website. It's a great place to refer back to. We list all of our upcoming events, uh, including our workshops, our 4-H club meetings, uh, different fun events that we have throughout the year. And we currently operate 16 community gardens, three urban farms, a commercial test kitchen, and a community food forest. Our vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. So we do that by supporting growers through a whole slew of ways. So if you're a backyard gardener, fantastic. If you want to make money off your farming operation, we love that. Uh, whatever you're here for, we just appreciate you taking the time to learn about regenerative agriculture and using practices that give back to our planet instead of just taking away. So this webinar tonight is generously funded by the 2501 grant from the USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement, and we're very lucky to be joined once again by MU Extension Horticulture Field Specialist and Food Safety Trainer Patrick Byers, and I'll let him get started and take it away in just a second, um, but it would be helpful as we go along we really encourage you to ask questions and be a part of the conversation. We love tailoring the content to the audience here, and we want to make sure that you're really getting out of this what you came here for. So be sure to drop your questions into the Q&A box and then leave the chat free for other comments that you might uh, <clears throat> have as we go along. And as I said, that's where I'll put the majority of our links also. And then once you leave the workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post-workshop survey. And that survey is used in our reporting to the USDA. And it also helps us provide meaningful workshops in the future. So we really appreciate your feedback. It's a short survey if you don't mind just clicking through it after we conclude. And then if you would like to refer to this workshop later or check out some of the other videos in our agricultural playlist on YouTube, uh, please do so. You could spend hours there. And I know people who do because I see the comments and the likes that they leave. But we have topics recorded um, on everything from soil health and composting to beekeeping, elderberry production, berry production, produce food safety at all different levels. Um, we, we really have a lot of different topics that we love talking about and answering questions about. So Without further ado, I will stop sharing and I will hand it off to Patrick. Okay. Anna, can you hear me? Are we good? Look good, sound good. All right. Fabulous. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start off by sharing my screen as well. And we'll bring up the presentation. Okay. Let's see here. Let me take care of a few more controls here. All right, Anna, can we see the presentation? Is it in presentation mode? Uh, it, yes, but I think we could see your notes. How is that? Perfect, there it is. Okay, very good, thank you. Well, it is a joy to be with you here this evening, and I want to thank uh, Anna and Springfield Community Gardens for the opportunity to spend the next, oh, 60 minutes or so talking about regenerative agriculture. And this is a topic that is of just dire interest these days. And 
Springfield Community Gardens has a strong commitment to regenerative agriculture, and I've enjoyed the association that I've had with SCG over the years, you know, again, focusing on such important issues. Um, tonight, we're going to, as I said, spend roughly 60 minutes together going through the uh, fundamentals of regenerative agriculture. And as Anna mentioned, uh, we love to have feedback. We love to, first of all, have interaction with the folks who join the workshop live. And you can do that by entering uh, your questions in the Q&A. And we'll have time at the end of the presentation to unmute and, and tackle questions orally. So that opportunity will be there as well. And, and again, as we go through the material, uh, there, there obviously are many, many, many more things that we could say. And in fact, uh, this subject is, is worthy of you know, a, a college semester course. But tonight we're going to touch on the high points uh, in our time together. As Anna mentioned, I am a horticulture field specialist and produce, a produce food safety specialist with University of Missouri Extension. I'm based in Southwest Missouri and I've worked in outreach education uh, primarily to, to farmers for a little over 33 years. And it's been just the joy of my life to, uh, to serve this, this population that is so critically important to, to all of us. And um, again, I, I think by the time we're done tonight, uh, hopefully you'll share the passion that I share for regenerative agriculture and the hope that it offers to, to all of us. Uh, certainly want to acknowledge the role that Springfield Community Gardens is playing in developing our local food system in Southwest Missouri. Anna shared the vision, it's right there, but uh, again, it's, it's an extremely important um, role that SCG plays. And it's been a joy, as I said, in, in my career to, to be spending time with such uh, dedicated folks. And then again, as Anna mentioned, this program, this project in, in general, and my presentation in particular, supported by a 2501 grant from the USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. And we certainly want to acknowledge the support of USDA in this effort related to, to um, uh, regenerative agriculture. Well, this is what I'd like to do tonight. Uh, first, we'll have an overview of regenerative agriculture. And, and quite frankly, uh, regenerative agriculture is a difficult topic to define. And we'll spend a little bit of time to, to lead off tonight just talking about what it, it is and the perceptions of, of regenerative agriculture. And we'll talk a bit about some of the challenges that agriculture is facing today and, and, and the, the hope, again, that regenerative agriculture offers to overcome some of the challenges both today and, and also those challenges that are, are present because of uh, agricultural history. And so again, this will be, I think, a good uh, way to set the stage. And then we'll talk about some regenerative agricultural practices. And there'll be definitely a focus on soil health. We'll also focus on the integration of animals and plants into farming systems. We'll talk about biodiversity. We'll talk about ways that the farmers can, can uh, look at benchmarks and feel understanding the, uh, the progress that they've made in their journey towards regenerative agriculture. And then we'll touch on the social aspects of regenerative agriculture, certainly to the farmers, but also to the, the uh, communities and society at large. And uh, this I think is, is a very interesting thing to consider. Frequently in a conversation of, regarding regenerative agriculture, the focus is on farming practices, but there's definitely a social aspect to regenerative agriculture as well. And then we'll just end with a couple of thoughts on certifications that are available for farmers who are interested in adopting regenerative agricultural practices on their farms. And again, as we go through this material, if a question or a comment occurs to you, please enter that in the Q&A and we will, we will definitely tackle it. Okay, so defining regenerative agriculture, as I mentioned, is, is quite frankly a challenge. It's one of those things where we, we kind of know what it is and we kind of know where we're heading, but actually putting down on paper a definition is a little trickier. This particular definition was developed by the University of California Santa Cruz Center for Regenerative Agriculture. And the definition there is that regenerative agriculture is a holistic land management practice that leverages the power of photosynthesis and plants to close the carbon cycle and to build soil health, crop resilience, and nutrient density. So I think that's a reasonable starting point in our discussion of, of regenerative agriculture. So again, kind of keep these thoughts in mind as we go through the uh, rest of our time tonight together. 
I think it's important to point out that regenerative agriculture is both process-based and outcome-based. And when we talk about process-based, and we'll define all of these these uh, processes here in, in a few moments, but it certainly has a component relate, related to grazing management, reduced tillage, uh, the, the use of practices such as cover crop utilization, reduction of fertilizer and herbicide pesticide use. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that integration of livestock and cropping systems into a regenerative whole. But it's also outcome-based. You know, the, the, there are goals, there are benchmarks that we work towards when we open up the discussion of regenerative agriculture on a farm. And that could include the increase or improvement in biodiversity, uh, improved or increased carbon sequestration, and soil organic carbon composition uh, developments, improvements. So again, both a processed based definition and an outcome-based definition. And frequently when, when people discuss regenerative agriculture, these two are blended into sort of a, of a hybrid definition. And that certainly is understandable and that certainly is useful. One comment that should be made, uh, regenerative agriculture is uh, not typically viewed as the same thing as sustainable agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is focused on rebuilding agricultural systems. Yes, using sustainable practices, but the goal with, with regenerative agriculture, as you might uh, uh, glean from, from the word regenerative, is to, is to repair damage that's occurred in the past. And as we move ahead to develop an agriculture that, again, is certainly sustainable in nature. So again, the, 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 the two terms, regenerative agriculture and sustainable agriculture, are not interchangeable. When we think about today's agricultural systems, there are certainly challenges that agriculture must rise to meet. And when we think about the, the things that agriculture must achieve, first of all, when we look at the, the uh, uh, population worldwide, agriculture is gonna be expected to feed over, over um, 50 billion people, I'm sorry, uh, in, in 2050, over, over 9 billion people in 2050, which, is a challenge, however you look at it. I think we can we can meet that challenge, but it certainly is going to take a focus on regenerative agriculture to repair some of the damage that has occurred in the past to the productive capacity of our farms. Regenerative agriculture must also provide a livelihood for farmers. And unfortunately, in, in many parts of the world, agriculture, quite frankly, has, has uh, exploited farmers. And it's important as we move ahead that the discussion related to regenerative agriculture include the ability of farmers to make a living wage and to have a reasonable livelihood from their farming efforts. And then the third point, regenerative agriculture must protect the environment, certainly the productive base that is, is uh, utilized in agriculture, but also the environment at large. And agriculture must uh, have a focus on certainly repairing some of the damage that agriculture has caused to the environment and moving ahead reducing the impact of agriculture on the environment. So this is a, a pretty tall order, pretty tall order. And we have to answer these questions because obviously our existence here on earth depends upon uh, rising to these challenges. Now, when we think about the, the challenges that are facing agriculture, they're, you know this is a starting point for the discussion of regenerative agriculture. First of all, farming, uh, practices in the past have degraded the resource base, especially the soil that agriculture depends on, that productive agriculture depends on. And again, issues such as soil erosion, uh, issues such as desertification, uh, issues such as soils poisoned by production practices, these are all situations that we have to improve. There are also water issues related to agricultural practices and things such as, as um, the pollution of rivers, uh, lakes, and, and perhaps even on the scale of, of ocean issues, oceanic pollution issues have to be addressed related to agriculture. There are certainly pesticide issues and pesticide resistance issues that have to be addressed. Uh, agriculture is a contributor certainly to pollution and also to uh, CO2 emissions. And these challenges must be addressed as well. And then, as I mentioned, there are serious issues related to the sustainability of farmers and farm families, and also the sustainability of rural economies. And we have to tackle these challenges as well. I, I like this, this picture here. This was a picture that um, I received permission to use from Ray Archuleta, who was uh, 
a retired soil scientist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service of the USDA. And he was one of the, uh, the uh, uh, people who were early on recognized these, these agricultural challenges and the roles that, that farmers and others play in addressing these challenges, and particularly when it comes to the discussion of soil health. And his statement looking at this picture was, this soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. And I think putting these, these human terms on a soil situation really brings home some of the, the realities that we face related to the important issue of soil health. Now, when we think about regenerative agriculture and the benefits that it offers, both to certainly farmers, to, to uh, communities, to society at large, regenerative agriculture contributes to generating and building soils. And we have to recognize that all life on earth is based upon the soil, okay? Certainly based upon plants, but obviously plant uh, growth and uh, particularly agriculture depends upon soils, soils that are healthy, soils that are fertile. And so regenerative agriculture contributes to, to uh, regenerating soils and building soil fertility and building soil health. Regenerative agriculture has a positive role to play in water relations in the soil, certainly in water percolation, water retention in the soil. And if there is runoff, this runoff is clean and safe, okay? The, the goal on a farm is to capture as much of the naturally occurring rainfall that occurs on that farm as possible and retain that water for, for crop use. And if there is wa uh, water runoff, you know, particularly after, after heavy rainfall events, that water should be safe and clean. Regenerative agriculture also has a role to play in increasing biodiversity. And increasing biodiversity has a positive effect on ecosystem health and on farming systems health. And it has a critical role to play in resiliency. And in our current era of challenges related to the climate, resiliency is, is critically important from the standpoint of, of maintaining and growing our agriculture to meet those challenges that I mentioned earlier. Uh, regenerative agriculture also inverts the carbon emissions of current agriculture. To, to one not just of contributing to atmospheric CO2, but sequestering carbon that is already present. You know, certainly capturing that uh, carbon that is, is uh, uh, developed in the course of agriculture, but actually capturing carbon that is there on a legacy basis and thereby cleansing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. So again, agriculture can become a, a positive influence on carbon issues in the atmosphere. Now, when we think about regenerative agriculture, it's sometimes called a collection of tools. And again, as I mentioned, um, uh, definitions frequently focus on the processes of regenerative agriculture as well as the outcomes. And looking at this diagram, this gives us a feel for what uh, might be present in the regenerative agriculture toolbox. And we'll talk about these practices here in the remainder of our time together. But it includes practices such as the use of cover crops, the use of no-till and reduced soil disturbance, practices that build soil health and soil carbon, uh, grazing systems, diversified cropping and agroforestry, nutrient management, the use of buffer strips, the growing of biodiversity, and a focus on pollinators. So all of these are tools that help lead us towards the goals of regenerative agriculture. Okay, let's take a look at some of the the um, processes and the outcomes that I mentioned in that early definition. And we'll start with maintaining and enhancing soil health. Again, soil health has a prominent place in regenerative agriculture discussions. And again, some of the, um, the uh, tools that are, are in place to help us maintain and enhance soil health, first of all, maintaining soil cover throughout the year. When we think about soil health, we think about um, biodynamic environments in the soil. You know, the soil is, in essence, a living uh, community of organisms. Some of these are micro, uh, microscopic in nature, things such as bacteria, fungi. Others are larger, uh, insects, earthworms, arthropods, uh, other, other organisms found in the soil. But they all have a function. They all have a role to play in the community that is a healthy soil. And maintaining soil cover has been uh, sometimes uh, presented as essentially feeding the life in the soil. And plant roots uh, have a, a critically important role to play from the standpoint of maintaining soil health. 
because in many cases, plant roots are a primary food source for soil-borne organisms uh, in several, several fashions. First of all, of course, plant roots themselves, as they, they, uh, the, the tips of root systems die and decompose, they become a food source. Plant roots shed cells as they grow. These shed cells become a food source. Plant roots release substances, carbohydrates, carbohydrates and sugars that directly feed soil organisms. And there are also complex uh, uh, symbiotic relationships between plant roots and a number of different soil organisms. Uh, in many cases, uh, well, to give two examples, uh, mycorrhizal associations with soil-borne fungi and plant roots, and then the associations between particular bacterial species that enable plants to, to capture nitrogen and make that available in the, uh, in the uh, soil system. So again, maintaining that soil cover uh, uh, is, is important from the standpoint of certainly having uh, living roots. And, and the third point touches on those comments that I made. There's also benefits to having cover on the surface of the soil to help protect the uh, three-dimensionality of the soil. Uh, it, it's very interesting when you look at uh, uh, time release, or not time release, but time stop uh, uh, videos of raindrops striking a bare soil versus raindrops striking a soil that has cover in place. It's remarkable the damage that uh, a bare soil experiences from an event that is seemingly innocuous. Uh, other things such as, as driving on soils, uh, the impact of, of foot traffic, other things can, can cause structural issues, can cause structural damage to soils that can be mitigated to some extent if a soil cover is maintained on the soil. It's also important to minimize soil disturbance. Uh, the organisms that live in the soil do not respond well to the disruption of their environment. And, you know, for example, many of the fungi found in the soil are filamentous and maybe several meters in length. And soil disturbance breaks the, their, their bodies and can cause uh, damage or death to these organisms. I talked about the importance of living roots. Uh, diversity is important in the vegetation community because a diversity of, of uh, plant species leads to a diversity of food sources in the soil. And that in turn supports a diversity of life in the soil. And then we'll talk more about the incorporation of animals into production systems, but grazing animals provide benefits as well. Certainly the uh, deposition of manure becomes an important uh, nutrient source and also a soil conditioning source. And just the activity of the animals pushing uh, uh, surface organic matter and manure into the soil with their hooves is beneficial. Now, some of the regenerative practices that we can do to, to reach these goals, cover cropping. Cover cropping basically is the practice of maintaining something living in the uh, productive area of, of a farm. And you know, the productive area of a farm during a portion of the year will have cash crops or, or you know, crops that are be grown that are grown for, for income generation. But there are also periods of time where those crops are not present and in, in a production unit. And this is the point where cover crops can be placed. Cover crops may not have direct value from the standpoint of, of human food, but they have an inestimable value from the standpoint of maintaining cover and maintaining active living roots in soils that would otherwise be, be bare. So that's very important. Crop rotation. Crop rotation is an effort to incorporate uh, diversity into cropping systems. And uh, again, having a, a well thought out crop rotation can be extremely beneficial from the standpoint of maintaining the variety of soil life. Soil inoculants, composts and manures. These are all um, uh, amendments that actually provide living organisms into the soil system. Soil inoculant is typically a, a mixture of microorganisms, sometimes applied to seeds, sometimes applied directly to the soil. Compost, of course, is decomposed organic materials and manures are animal wastes. And all of these, these amendments are beneficial from the standpoint of uh, uh, enhancing soil life, enhancing soil health. Conservation tillage, again, the idea of minimizing the disturbance of the soil through reduced or modified tillage practices is extremely valuable. Uh, managed grazing, the, the idea of uh, using animals as a soil enhancement tool is very important. Animals can have either a positive or a negative impact on soil health. In managed grazing systems and, and planned livestock incorporation, 
this influence is definitely positive. Um, the idea of managing rangelands differently, you know, seeding in additional crops into rangelands to improve diversity, biodiversity, and incorporating biomass into rangelands can be very helpful. The use of hedgerows and pollinator habitat can be helpful as well. Uh, plantings along lakes and streams are helpful, riparian plantings, buffers, and filter strips, and then silvopasture, again, improving the diversity in a pasture setting by incorporating crop plants, either annual crops or perennial crops. Let's uh, drill a little bit deeper into some of these practices, and we'll start with cover cropping and biomass. And cover cropping uh, provides a number of benefits from the standpoint of regenerative agriculture. The first, of course, is crop protection by maintaining a living plant cover as, as, uh, for, for as, as much of the, the year as, as possible. Now, again, as I mentioned before, it may or may not be used as a uh, cash crop. You know, frequently there's forage value to it, but uh, th there's a huge value from the standpoint of having that crop present and protecting and improving soil health and soil structure. The main purpose of cover crops, again, to, to increase soil fertility and soil quality, to help manage soil erosion. Again, crop uh, soils that are protected by cover crops are soils that are less vulnerable to erosion. To improve water retention, cover crops present on the soil improve the uh, percolation of water into the soil after rainfall events. Cover crops are valuable to manage weeds, pests, and diseases. And cover crops, if properly planned out, and particularly if the cover crop contains a diversity of species, obviously increases biodiversity. And cover crops can provide habitat for native wildlife, certainly for insects, but also for, for other types of native wildlife. And then, as, as mentioned previously, cover crops can be used as a forage in some cases. So there can be a direct benefit to the agricultural system uh, through the use of cover crops. Another uh, uh, practice that we'll talk a bit about is crop rotation. And lots of benefits to crop rotation. Now crop rotation needs to be a, a or developing a crop rotation plan needs to be a deliberative process. Uh, much of my experience is with specialty crops, particularly vegetables and cover cropping is, is critically important from the standpoint of the long-term uh, regenerative practice of, of a farm, of a farming system with vegetables and some of the benefits of crop rotation. First of all, it too can reduce soil depletion and crop uh, rotation can actually reduce the need for pesticide and fertilizer use. Uh, to give you an example, uh, there are certain soil-borne uh, diseases that can be managed by crop rotation, by rotating into crops that are not susceptible to the soil-borne disease and uh, essentially eliminating the, uh, the uh, needed host for the disease to develop. And so again, crop rotation can be very helpful in managing some of these problems on a farm. Crop rotation can reduce soil erosion. It can also enhance biodiversity and it improves the quality as well as the fertility of the soil. And crop rotation can also increase soil organic carbon. So some definite benefits related to crop rotation. And research and farmers' experience has shown that crop rotation can have a significant impact on carbon sequestration. So again, the idea of farming practices actually helping to heal the atmospheric carbon situation is one of the, again, one of the, the really valuable uh, results of regenerative agricultural practices such as crop rotation. Now, from the standpoint of tillage, uh, the adoption of low or no tillage practices is, is a very important aspect of regenerative agriculture. And the goal of low or no tillage is to basically preserve the three-dimensionality of the soil. When we think of the soil, uh, again, if we just look at it from the surface, we, we don't really have a good grasp of the fact that this is a three-dimensional system. But once we, we you know, turn a shovel full of soil over, we recognize that soil is much more than just sand, silt, and clay. Soil is a three-dimensional system that includes, yes, solids. I mentioned sand, silt, clay, and organic matter, but it also includes voids. And it includes the, uh, the uh, grouping together of the soil uh, constituents, that sand, silt, clay, and organic matter, into larger groupings that are called PEDs. And these PEDs again, provide the three-dimensionality, and you have to have three-dimensionality in the soil. First of all, for, 
for uh, water percolation, but also to provide spaces for, uh, for plant root growth and spaces for the life in, in the uh, soil. So low or no till pra practices preserve that three-dimensionality three that is so critical from the standpoint of soil health. Lower no-till practices also reduce weed pressure. There, uh, there is a, a, a nearly inexhaustible supply of weeds uh, present in the seed form in the soil. This is called the weed seed bank. And in many cases, the only thing that keeps these weed seeds from germinating is the fact that they are at some depth in the soil. But tillage practices turn up weed seeds and they encourage the germination of weed seeds and the growth of weeds. And anyone who has practiced tillage on a regular basis in, in a garden or a farm setting recognizes this. After each pass of tillage, there is a new crop of weeds that then have to be controlled moving ahead. Uh, lower no-till practices also reduce carbon loss. Uh, tillage practices actually jumpstart some of the uh, biological activity in the soil that results in carbon loss. And while we do want biological activity in the soil, we wanna do what we can to maintain the soil carbon that is present in the soil in the form of organic matter. And lower no-till practices reduce the loss of the carbon in organic matter, again, by maintaining it at a depth in the soil. Lower no-till practices conserve the life in the soil. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, soil life does not respond favorably to disruption. And that's what tillage does. And then lower no-till practices preserve the three-dimensionality of the soil that is so important from the standpoint of improving water infiltration. Hey, Patrick, I got a quick yes. question from someone in the audience. Of course. Um, they're wrapping their head around cover crops in a vegetable bed for the first time. What do you do with the cover crop when you're ready to plant it if the goal is not to till it under? So what do you do, yeah, when you're ready to plant, but you don't want to till the cover crop into the bed? Right. Um, now, that, that is, that's a, a, a very pertinent question. And when we use cover crops and vegetable cropping systems, frequently we're, we're inserting them into breaks in the, the production style of the vegetable crops. And uh, when we're at a point where we need to, to place a cash crop into that space, we've got to do something with a cover crop, right? Uh, there are instances where where uh, modified tillage can be helpful, but there are also ways to to see the benefit of the cover crop uh, kind of moving ahead after the uh, cash crop has been planted. And one way this can be done is by terminating the cover crop without tillage. And this can be done in, in several ways. Uh, there are implements that actually cut the cover crop. There are other in implements with particular cover crops that can actually flatten the stems or break the the uh, connection between the stem and the root system leading to termination as well. And then the cover crop residue can remain on the soil surface as a mulch. Again, that idea of, of providing permanent cover on the soil. If it's not living cover, at least it should be a mulch cover. And then over time, the life in the soil will incorporate that surface layer of organic matter into the soil. Earthworms in particular play an important role in moving organic matter from the surface into the soil. So typically what's done is to terminate the cover crop. In many cases, the cover crop residue remains and the crop is, uh, cash crop is planted through the residue of the cover crop. Excellent. And uh, we actually have a workshop on cover cropping this Saturday at the American Indian Center Garden. So I'm going to put a link to that in the chat as well. But that's a free event and you can come and uh, that's cover cropping for garden usage, not necessarily farm usage. Of course, you know, you can extend that information outward, but uh, for the purposes of this workshop, it is for garden use. Excellent, thank you for that question. And again, keep the questions coming. Now let's turn our attention to uh, management practices for nutrients. And uh, traditional agriculture has a heavy reliance on synthetic nutrients uh, and also a heavy reliance on, on other synthetically derived chemicals, but we're going to first focus on nutrients. And one of the goals of regenerative agriculture is to reduce this reliance on synthetic nutrients and to increase the use of organic nutrient sources. And moving ahead, we really have to focus on nutrients wherever they're available. You know, and, and as an example, the, the, uh, 
uh, uh, proper use of manure is an excellent example of what previously was considered a waste stream, but now is, is a valuable source of organic nutrients moving ahead. Very important for farmers to adopt what's called the 4R approach, using the right source of nutrients in the right rate, the right time, and the right place. So in some cases, we're actually modifying the way that we, we apply and, and uh, time applications of nutrients using regenerative practices. A uh, good example is with manure applications. Um, it's, it's important when thinking about the use of manure that we use methods that maintain the nutrient benefits on the field after the manure has been applied. And again, if, if manure is not used properly, there can be issues related to manure runoff, which ends up in, in runoff water from the farm, which can cause uh, issues with uh, pollution in streams, lakes, rivers, and, and indeed in the ocean. So very important to time manure applications properly and to use methods such as uh, 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 imply, uh, applying manure in a compost form to reduce the risk of runoff. And in fact, composting can make the nutrients available in manures uh, or can make manures a more effective source of nutrients. So composting has a very important role to play in regenerative agriculture. The integration of livestock where uh, farmers allow livestock to deposit manure in a natural form in pastured areas or in areas where cropping has, has ended and yet there may be residue for the livestock to graze on. Again, the, the natural deposition and then the, the uh, activity of the hooves of the animals pressing that manure into the soil is very beneficial. We also need to look more closely at the use of, of uh, crops that can actually capture nitrogen. And I hinted at this earlier when I talked about cover crops and the association that plant roots can form with certain types of bacteria. And well, let, let's discuss that in, in a bit more depth. There are a group of plants that form a symbiotic relationship with a group of bacteria. These are called the rhizobacteria. And through this association, uh, the plants are able to capture atmospheric nitrogen and through the intervention of the bacteria, make that nitrogen available, certainly to the host plant, but also to the soil system in general. And when cover crops are terminated that can capture nitrogen, then the nitrogen that is in their root systems becomes available to the other crops that are planted after the cover crop. Now, we frequently think of legumes as the primary uh, uh, crops that, that capture nitrogen. And indeed, many of the legumes do, but there are other crops, other cover crops as well that can provide this benefit. And then um, the, the idea of using cover crops as a tool to capture nutrients that are in the soil and hold those nutrients so that they're not lost. Uh, frequently after a cropping cycle, you know, after a vegetable crop or whatever the crop might be is, is, is ended, there still are nutrients present in the soil from the nutrient applications that were made for that crop. Now, planting a cover crop can be very helpful because the plant, the cover crop itself will capture those nutrients. And then when the cover crop is terminated, those nutrients then become available moving ahead. If we don't use a cover crop in this setting and we allow that site to remain fallow, there's a good possibility that the nutrients present in that soil may be lost to a deep percolation runoff or, or through other means. So again, a cover crop can be helpful in capturing nutrients making them available for the crop that follows after the cover crop. And then buffer strips are very helpful to hold nutrients on a side and reduce runoff from fields during rainfall events. Okay, so some more thoughts on improving water percolation retention, and then that focus, as I mentioned earlier, on water runoff. Uh, again, maintaining cover improves water percolation. So having a cover on the soil, and looking at this picture here, we can see a uh, a mulched setting where the just the physical presence of the mulch breaks the force of raindrops, breaks the force of sprinkler applied irrigation, and allows the upper structure of the soil to remain intact. And then this upper structure can then welcome water into uh, the, the uh, lower structure of the soil. Maintaining soil health also improves water percolation and retention. So again, cover and soil health, very important. Um, chemical pollution in ground and surface water is a serious issue uh, in our agricultural systems. And anything that we can do to reduce chemical and pesticide inputs 
is 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 important. And in fact, regenerative practices, regenerative practices on farms and ranches frequently focus on ways to reduce chemical and pesticide inputs. And then the result is a reduction in, in algal blooms and um, a reduction in drinking water pollution. There are many areas in uh, agricultural production areas around the world where soil water and uh, particularly um, deep water have been polluted by agricultural chemicals. And regenerative agriculture offers hope in addressing that issue and keeping that problem from happening moving ahead. And then again, improved water efficiency from better soil health leads to better soil water holding capacity so that the rainfall that strikes our soils is then held by those soils for crop use. And it also improves groundwater recharge. So this is, is obviously important as we draw water from groundwater resources for irrigation. It's important to do everything we can to recharge those resources. So again, these regenerative practices have long-term positive effects as well as short-term positive effects. Okay, let's turn our attention to animals and animal waste. And there are positive benefits to integrating animals into farming systems, and certainly a benefit from the standpoint of soil health. There's also from the standpoint of the, uh, the uh, sustainability of the farmer, Anytime you diversify the income basis on a farm, you reduce the risks that are associated with raising a single product. So having livestock as part of an overall farming mix, along with, with uh, plant-based crops, can help make the uh, income potential of that farm more resilient. Animals can also play a role in fertilizer inputs, as we've mentioned earlier. And we can also see the reduction of animal feed costs when we incorporate animals into systems where they utilize either naturally occurring forage or they utilize the waste products at the end of a, a cropping cycle. There's also reduced labor and machinery costs in some places where people are actually using animals as an energy source, as a draft animal. And then there's increased carbon sequestration by integrating animals and animal waste into farming systems. Let's think a little bit about manure. And again, in, in years past, manure was treated as a, a waste product, as a liability, as a problem. Now, again, with this emphasis on a regenerative agriculture, manure is an asset. And we've come a long ways from those days where manure was placed in, in lagoons and then it was pumped and hauled away from the farm. Now manure is, is uh, recognized as the asset that it is and regenerative practices have developed ways to, to use this resource to improve soil health, to improve grazing croplands, and to do other, other things that, again, have positive benefits on the farm. And again, just a, a general statement, whenever you graze cropland, you improve soil fertility. Okay, certainly you increase soil microbial density in grazed soils, and you inc uh, increase organic matter content through the deposition of the manure, again, that is then forced into the ground through the, uh, the action of the hooves of the grazing animals. There's also benefits for, for farmers who use cover crops and no-till methods because animals can, can actually be, uh, can utilize cover crops as a graze, you know, as a forage. And while they're foraging, they, as I said, as I've said several times, they, they provide that benefit in integrating manure into the soil with their hooves. Uh, managed grazing and crop rotation in tandem work best with this approach to avoid overcompaction of the soil. Again, if animals are confined to a particular area in, uh, in, in a pasture, there can be negative aspects to that. So when we talk about integrating animals into production systems, it has to be done again in a deliberate plan process, and we call this managed grazing. Okay, now let's turn our attention to uh, promoting biodiversity. And when we use the term biodiversity, we're talking about the variety. We're talking about the different organisms that exist in a system. And for our purposes, we'll be talking about plants, animals, and, and microorganisms. And certainly the ones that we see above the soil, but also the ones that are present in the soil. And again, remember that the, the soil e ecosystem is intimately linked with the above ground ecosystem as well. 
So again, when we think about biodiversity, we're talking about biodiversity in, in, in the, the, the entire whole of the environment on the farm, both above and below the surface of the soil. Biodiverse systems are typically more stable. Again, very important in, in times of, of uh, 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 environmental challenges. Biodiverse systems withstand disturbances better and they recover better than less diverse systems. So again, from the standpoint of resiliency, biodiversity has a critical role to play. Some of the benefits of encouraging diversity, first of all, improved soil quality. Secondly, we do see enhanced insect weed and disease control when we encourage biodiversity. Biodiversity also encourages beneficial organisms that can directly influence the cost of producing crops. So there's a positive benefit from the standpoint of, of uh, financial sustainability. And, and uh, biodiversity also spreads economic risk. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the, the importance of diversity in income streams on a farm. That's what we're talking about here. And so when we encourage diversity, not just in the, the natural world, but also in the, um, the way that the farm is organized from the standpoint of profit centers, this can be a very positive thing when it comes to uh, the regenerative agriculture on a social sense. Okay, so some ways that we can encourage biodiversity. Hedgerows and pollinator habitat. This is a nice picture here. It shows uh, cropping systems, but it also shows less intensively managed areas that border these cropping systems. And again, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about hedgerows. And hedgerows are basically an, are, are plantings of dense vegetation. Frequently, they're, they're, uh, there's a diversity of species in it. And if you look at this picture here, you can see uh, in the... the uh, hedgerow closest to us, there's a diversity of woody plant species. And again, the, the vegetation may be woody plants, it may be shrubs, small trees, it could be perennial grasses, it could be other, other plant species that are planted along the edges of more intensively managed agricultural fields. Several functions. First of all, they serve as a windbreak. They also serve as habitat, you know, as a way to add biodiversity and create habitat for organisms such as beneficial insects and and perhaps other wildlife that have positive aspects on the farm. Uh, frequently, hedgerows and pollinator habitat are woody species. And as woody species develop and grow, they store carbon in the, the woody structure of the plant. And again, so here's an aspect of, of uh, uh, hedgerows and pollinator habitat that we might not immediately think about when we think about the benefits. But yes, serving as a carbon sink and a carbon storage site is very important in the biomass of a hedgerow uh, or, or a similar type planting. Pollinator habitat. Um, this is an interesting picture for me. I had a chance to tour a regenerative agriculture farm in, in Iowa several years ago. And this farm was a specialty crop farm. You can see on the right, the intensively managed specialty crop production units, the beds where vegetables and fruit were being grown. But then as we look towards the left, we see an area that uh, actually is a, um, a reconstructed prairie with a, a diversity of plant species, both grasses and broadleaves. And it was very interesting to me to stand, first of all, in the uh, crop production area. And yes, there was evidence of, of good management there and, and regenerative practices in place. But when I stood in the uh, area on the left, the biodiverse area, I was just stunned by the life around me, certainly the plant life, but also the presence of, of uh, insects, the presence of small birds, the presence of other life that then offers benefits to the more intensively managed area where the specialty crops are being grown. It was a very, very nice illustration of sort of the synergistic effect of having biodiversity close at hand to areas that are more intensively managed for crops. One other thing I'll point out, if you look towards the back, you see that that uh, T-shaped pole. That was actually a raptor perch. Again, the idea of providing habitat for um, birds of prey that then helped with pest problems in the uh, uh, more intensively managed cropping area. Uh, we can extend this discussion of diversity into pasture settings. And the idea of having pastures that are a diversity of grasses, perhaps a mix of warm and cool season grasses, and also forbs, broadleaf plants in the mix, is, is very helpful. And again, this should be a deliberate process. Uh, frequently, uh, pastured areas are 
are, are not diverse from the standpoint of the species found, but by selective seeding and pasture improvement, you can improve diversity and make the pasture itself a much more productive system from the standpoint, certainly of, of uh, diverse life, but also a more healthy and nutritious site for the grazing animals that are going to utilize that pasture. And then we can go a, a step beyond that and develop silvopasture approaches where we actually produce crop plants in uh, pastured areas. And in many cases, these are shrubs or trees. Buffer strips, uh, again, this is somewhat akin to, uh, to uh, windbreaks, but buffer strips placed along the edges of fields uh, give benefits from the standpoint of, of promoting biodiversity. And we can see this here. If we look to the left, we see corn. Uh, a planting of corn, a field of corn is, is obviously not biodiverse, but having this buffer area that is adjacent to the cropping area that is diverse, again, provides habitat for beneficial insects and other other helpful organisms in close proximity to the crop field. There's also other benefits from the standpoint of soil erosion management and holding nutrients on a production site. Frequently buffer strips, as we see here, are at field margins, but they might also be along riparian corridors on streams and lakes. And they can also be in the contours of sloping fields. You know, there may be uh, uh, areas in sloping fields that are too steep to effectively crop, but they can be effectively put into more or less permanent buffer strips. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about um, farming systems and what we can do from the standpoint of biodiversity. And we touched on this already in our discussion of cover crops and crop rotation. But farmers, again, through a deliberate process of planning and, and implementation can add biodiversity in the way they select and, or, and arrange crops. And uh, we see a nice example in this high tunnel of a diversity of crop species in, in a tunnel. And this farmer actually has in place a plan where uh, they will know where a different crop is going to go each time these beds are turned over from one crop to another. Again, a very carefully planned out process of crop rotation and then slipping in cover crops as opportunities present themselves. Agroforestry, which we touched on in our discussion of silvopasture, offers many advantages as well. Certainly conservation benefits and, and economic opportunities to, again, to diversify income streams on a farm that may be more focused on agri animal agriculture than on specialty crops. But there's certainly opportunities from the standpoint of agroforestry. Now, a discussion of uh, regenerative agriculture has to increase, has to include a discussion of integrated pest management. And pest management is possible in many cases without the use of chemical inputs. And regenerative agriculture has a strong emphasis on non-chemical approaches to managing pests. When we think about uh, regenerative agriculture and IPM, first step is to identify pests, hosts, and beneficial organisms that are already present. And then to develop monitoring guidelines for the pests, to establish an action threshold for the pest, and then to look at the spectrum of control options that are available, you know, again, beyond chemicals, and then monitoring, evaluate, and documenting the results to see if the, uh, the IPM approach is indeed achieving the goals that a regenerative farmer has in place. So again, it's a very deliberate process that includes identification, the development and implementation of management strategies, and the evaluation of the effectiveness of the program. Now, some of the pest management strategies that are used in regenerative agriculture, first of all, preventative control. The idea of, for example, of planting crops in, in uh, times during the production cycle where pests may not be present. Uh, a very early planting or a very late planting may actually miss the period of time that a, a, a insect pest is present in planting. There's also genetic control. You know, Using crops that have genetic resistance to pests can be very helpful from the standpoint of of uh, IPM. Biological control, the idea of providing habitat for beneficial insects or actually introducing beneficial insects into a cropping system can be very helpful. Mechanical control, something as, as straightforward as using insect netting as we see in this picture here, can help exclude pests from crop plants and reduce the need for chemicals. And if chemicals are used, they are chosen with a deliberate emphasis on reducing the impact 
of those chemicals on non-target organisms and on the environment at large. So if chemical control is needed, again, a very deliberate process, thought process to use those chemicals that have a reduced impact. Okay, now as, as we, we move towards the uh, conclusion of our discussion, we need to focus on regenerative agriculture and the benefits to farmers and society at large. And regenerative agriculture certainly has implications for the farmers that are involved. Uh, first of all, regenerative farms grow healthy food for certainly the farm family, but also for the community at large. And this is an important recognition on the part of many regenerative farmers. Regenerative farms also treat their farm workers, their apprentices and other laborers with respect, okay? They do not exploit the people who work on the farm. Regenerative farms provide on-farm staff with fair wages. Again, the idea of a fair living wage and also a seat at the decision-making table. So everyone who is involved on a regenerative farm has a, a contribution to make to the decisions that drive the, the practices on that farm, okay? Regenerative farms have a deep appreciation of the social and historical context in which they operate. Regenerative farms, for example, uh, acknowledge the contribution of indigenous farmers and also the contribution of black farmers in developing farming systems that, again, had regenerative aspects to them before conventional agriculture recognized the importance of these regenerative contexts. So again, a very important social context here as well. And then just uh, uh, kind of in general, and, and we know this from surveys of regenerative farmers, regenerative agriculture farmers and ranchers report that they feel joy through their professions. You know, they understand the importance of the work that they do, certainly from the standpoint of sustaining their families, but also from the standpoint of sustaining society as a whole. So there is a joy that is felt by the farmers involved in regenerative farms. And then from the standpoint of social responsibility, uh, the, the, the practices on a farm have implications across society, you know, well beyond the, the uh, limits, you know, the property limits of a farm. And with regenerative agriculture, we can reduce pollution and soil erosion. We can actively combat climate change. We can improve soil health. We can improve water health and we can improve air health. All of these can be result can be the result of regenerative practices on the farm. Regenerative farming has the possibility, the potential to improve farmers' bottom lines. Again, the idea of regenerating the lives of farmers that are involved in agriculture. And regenerative farmer, farming certainly can boost local economies. Uh, you know, certainly the economies that are directly connected with the farm, but in general, you know, when, when we look beyond just the local economy, we see benefits from regenerative agriculture across society. Well, we've talked about some of the practices. Now, what are the outcomes? You know, what are the, the uh, 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 measurements of progress when it comes to regenerative farming? First of all, we see an improvement in soil health and we can actually measure this. We see an improvement in sequestering carbon, especially as I mentioned, when we look at the uh, contribution of uh, organic matter amendments to the soil or the incorporation of woody plant species into a farming system. We see ways of boosting soil organic matter. We see degraded soils restored. Regenerative practices can reduce soil disturbance and prevent soil erosion. We can see a protection and an improvement in water quality, especially the water that leaves a farm. We see integrated crop, livestock, and conservation approaches. So again, we see these practices integrated successfully on regenerative farms. We've seen improved resilience of food systems to extreme weather and changing climate. We see enhanced biodiversity. Again, another thing that we can measure through the use of more plant types and animals. And we see an improvement in the health, vitality, and prosperity of farm families and of rural communities and of society at large. Now, again, these are these are all important things. These are all important outcomes. And, and yes, the movement towards regenerative uh, outcomes is incremental, but we, we all have to make an effort to reach these desirable outcomes. And we all have a role to play in, in achieving the goals of regenerative farming. 
Okay, I'll mention a couple of certifications for farmers who are interested in benchmarks relative to their progress along the road to regenerative agriculture. Certified Naturally Grown, this is a, a farmer-driven certification organization that um, will recognize progress towards regenerative agriculture by uh, providing certificates to farmers who, who uh, uh, achieve a, essentially a passing score on an audit of their regenerative practices on their farms. A similar uh, certification is the Regenerative Organic Certification that is available through the Rodale Institute. Similar uh, approach to looking at the regenerative practices on a farm and, and then acknowledging those practices in a certificate to the farmer. Okay, as we, we finish the presentation, I definitely have an assignment for, for all of you. Here's your reading list. These are excellent resources, particularly on the focus on soil health. And these all take a, a, a little bit different look at the importance of regenerative agriculture and the importance of soil health. But I encourage you to pick any or all of these, uh, these books as fabulous reading material. I guess if I had to start with one book just to set the stage, probably Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization would be a good place to start. It looks at the rise and fall of, of historical civilizations based on the way that soils were, were managed and the sort of the dire consequences of non-regenerative farming practices. It's a little bit of, a, of a, a difficult read, a little bit of a bummer, quite frankly, but it offers hope in that it provides us with goals, you know, provides us with guidance and how to move ahead as we, we look at cropping systems. But any of these publications would be useful from the standpoint of understanding the importance of regenerative agriculture. The University of Missouri Center for Regenerative Agriculture and the Noble Research Institute have uh, very nice resource uh, materials available on their websites. I definitely encourage you to visit those. And then regenerative agriculture is not just a, a goal for commercial scale agriculture. All of us, any of us who grow plants in a garden setting can play a role in regeneration as well. And as I was looking at resources on the internet, I came upon this uh, blog from the University of California Master Gardener Program that talked about regenerative practices in home gardens. And so again, another very interesting discussion of, of regenerative agriculture on a home scale. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation on regenerative agriculture. And again, hopefully uh, you, you share some of my passion, perhaps more of my passion <laughs> related to the importance of regenerative agriculture and the hope that it offers certainly farmers and local communities, but also the, the, the world at large as we move ahead. And um, I really have to, to salute the farmers who have adopted regenerative practices and encourage uh, all farmers to, to look at these concepts and to, to think about their personal situations and the benefits that regenerative agriculture can offer. Okay, I think at this point, uh, Anna, let's, let's tackle any questions that might be out there and, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, discontinue sharing. Okay, sounds good. And if you haven't gotten enough uh, soil talk in this week, tomorrow we have a, an in-person workshop at our hospital farm. Uh, Jason Hertz of Box Turtle Farm is coming and he's going to be talking more about using biosolarization as a means of organic soil disease control. So like Patrick said, we could talk about regenerative agriculture and all the different creative processes that farmers are using. Um, but that is happening tomorrow. If you want to deep dive on some of the latest, um, latest and hottest, literally temperature hottest ways of uh, organic soil disease control. So go back to our website uh, for information on that. And then we have one more question right now. If you are looking to incorporate some of these regenerative tools from a conventional farming standpoint, which would be the most impactful ones to begin with uh, that might actually be financially feasible? So, yeah, so, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. You know, how do you start your journey along uh, regenerative agriculture? I think 
a couple of things that would be important. I think, first of all, looking at ways to reduce tillage can be very helpful. Uh, secondly, the idea of maintaining cover on the soil, you know, as, as, as much of the time as possible is, is, and that cover obviously could be the crop, it could be crop residue, it could be a cover crop, just the idea of protecting soil structure and reducing soil erosion through the, the presence of cover of one sort or another on the soil, I think is important. Those are good starting points. Uh, if you if, if the farm is a diverse livestock and cropping farm, then looking at ways to, to uh, uh, put into place uh, specialized grazing approaches and then using animals as a means to, to uh, uh, add organic matter to the soil, I think that's a reasonable approach as well. You know, these man managed grazing systems, uh, you know, if, if, if it's a new practice for a farm, there are some upfront costs related to, to fencing, et cetera. But the, uh, the payoff, of course, is in a more diverse pasture situation and a better management of the wastes from those animals. I think the idea of improving the diversity in pasture settings is a relatively inexpensive way to, to start along the road to regenerative agriculture for livestock farmers. And lots of information on how to do that through the Natural Resources Conservation Service and also through University of Missouri Extension. So I guess those might be good places to start, but you know there are lots of ways that we can start on that journey. I think the important thing is, again, to start the journey. Thank you. And do you notice or have you ever encountered a farm making that switch to regenerative and uh, you know, maybe stopping the pesticide or herbicide use suddenly and how long it takes for the soil to, I guess, respond to that or what that transition might look like? Uh, you know, I've actually uh, read papers on work in Illinois and elsewhere looking at conventionally farmed land that was then transitioned into uh, low or no-till farming. And the uh, uh, positive benefits were were uh, apparent quite quite quickly. And within five years, uh, there were measurable improvements in soil health. You know, that was very interesting to me to see. Um, I've also worked in settings with uh, uh, special crop farmers that have moved away from the use of herbicides to the use of mulches or other approaches to manage weeds and have seen, uh, again, I, I really can't point to research, but anecdotal improvements in crop growth and crop production yields, those sorts of things. Typically, we're looking at perennial crops when we look at, at fruit systems that are transitioned away from herbicide use into more or less uh, permanently maintained mulches, but definitely positive benefits there. So, uh, you know, it, it does take time to heal problems, mm -hmm. but the, the again, the soil uh, environment has some resilience built into it. And then again, through the use of amendments such as manures, composts, and and uh, various biostimulants, we can see positive sort of jump starts to soil health. And uh, I, I remember uh, uh, situations where, for example, in in site preparation, perhaps the you know the productive part of the soil was removed, and farmers were left with less productive portions of the soil and the use of compost and and uh, other soil amendments, they were able to essentially regenerate a productive area in a soil that had been, been pretty seriously impacted. Yeah. So, you know, there, 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 are, there is hope in almost any setting from the standpoint of regenerative practices. Obviously, some, uh, some situations have been more severely impacted by agricultural practices than others, but there is always a positive benefit to adopting regenerative practices and, and sort of moving ahead on that road towards those goals that we talked about tonight. Excellent. And then uh, can you discuss how soil beneficial aggregates differ from soil clumps or clods? Well, you know, clump or clod is a non-technical, non-technical uh, description of soil aggregates. Um, now, sometimes clods are the result of, of uh, improper tillage, you know, when soils are too wet and and uh, the, the action of tillage actually creates artificial groupings of soil. In a natural setting, the clumpings are formed as a result of the, the um, and, and 
to be honest, there's still ongoing research to help us completely understand what happens when it comes to generating the three-dimensionality of a soil. But uh, current research suggests that the clumping of soil particles into three-dimensional units, you know, aggregates, clumps, whatever you choose to call them, is partly the result of the biological activity of the soil and also partly the result of plant roots. But the, it, it, when, when scientists look at what's going on in these three-dimensional units, there are essentially biological glues that help hold them together. And these biological glues, and I know that's a simplification, but these biological glues are formed uh, by secretions from plant roots and secretions from soil organisms. And these biological glues hold the clumps together. And these clumps are, are reasonably stable over time unless something you know, happens to disrupt them. And frequently the disruption of the, these, these three-dimensional groupings of soil particles is the result of human activity. It could be tillage, it could be uh, compaction from the driving of implements or equipment. It could be something as seemingly innocuous as the footsteps of the farmer. But all of these things can have a negative impact on the uh, three-dimensional units of, of a healthy soil. Excellent. I love this stuff. We could talk about soil for days and days and days. Well, you know, we could. And the reality is there's still so much more that we, we have yet to learn about the soil. I've, I've heard soil scientists say that we know more about the, the deepest depths of the oceans than we do about the 12 inches below our feet which is oh, really wow. interesting to think about. Yeah. And, and I sometimes think, personally speaking, that if I hadn't become a horticulturist, I probably would have become a soil scientist because I, I, like you, I find it fascinating. Very good. Well, those are all the questions for now. So if anyone thinks of something later, you know where to reach us and we are very happy to have these follow-up conversations. So thank you again. And I'll make sure that this recording gets added to our YouTube channel uh, within a week or so. All right. Well, have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.